So we all probably know that Luffy and the crew will eventually find the One Piece, and probably take down the government too. But what are the Straw Hats gonna do after that journey's over? I mean, assuming they each get to accomplish their individual dreams, and Oda doesn't kill any of them off, of course, it's pretty interesting to think about where they could all end up. Now, I'm not proposing that we'll get an actual sequel like Two Piece or anything like that, but it's just fun to think about, especially when you compare it to the past Pirate King disbanding his crew. Because Roger went and inspired a new generation of pirates, Rayleigh became a ship coder and drinks and gambles all the time, Crocus went right back to Laboon, which is where he was before, Odin went home to Wano, Shanks and Buggy each set out on their own adventures, and pretty much everyone has wondered at some point where Scop or Gabon might be waiting at. So each of them went somewhere very different than the next, but they all did things that were pretty befitting of their character. And I'm sure that Oda will cook up something even better for the Straw Hats. I mean, he's already shown us most of them at 40 and 60 years old, or 50 and 70 for Frankie, and Bonnie's aging powers have been on display quite a bit in Egghead. So the Straw Hats futures are definitely something that he's thought about, and so have I. So I broke this video down by crew member and you can find the order down below. Not too far from the like and subscribe buttons, which if you can click those two, I'd really appreciate it, because this video did take quite a long time to make. But the first crew member that I want to discuss is Nami. She's actually the one who inspired me to do this whole video in the first place, because while she's well known for a lot of things, like her navigation ability, how she can basically predict the weather, her love for money, the happiness punch, etc., there's one element to Nami that stands out the most to me, and that's how good of a motherly figure that she is. On numerous occasions in the story, we've seen Nami go out of her way to protect children in need, much like how Belmare did for her back in Oikot Kingdom. Whether it's the kids in Punk Hazard that were being experimented on, that scene at the end of Wano where she hugs Tama, or how she stood up to Ulti in defense of Tama, Nami has shown that she would never ever turn her back on a child. She's the kind of mom that Big Mom thinks Mother Carmel was, and that's why I think that when the series is all over, Nami will create her own orphanage that surpasses Carmel's House of Lambs, one that, you know, doesn't sell the kids off to the government. And this fits in really well because Oda has already connected Nami and Big Mom pretty closely. I mean, first off, Nami has part of Big Mom's soul in her climb attack with Zeus, but if we go back to that scene from the raid where Nami protected Tama, Oda juxtaposed that with Big Mom, because Big Mom also protected Tama at first because of her experience as Olin. She even zapped Ulti with the Mazer Cannon to help protect her. But then soon after that, Big Mom turned against Tama when she was running away from her, something that Nami would never do in any circumstance. This also exemplifies the dichotomy of Big Mom's personality, one half that is kind-hearted and friendly, and one that is evil and selfish. And while Nami certainly has some selfish traits herself, this situation kind of showed us that despite how many kids Big Mom has had, she's nowhere near the motherly figure that Nami already is. And with how much Oda's focused on parenthood lately with Ginny, Bonnie, and Kuma, this is easily one of my favorite answers in this entire video. And we know that our next destination in the story right now is Elbaf, where the House of Lambs originally was. So I bet Nami will even learn a little bit about Mother Carmel, the orphans, and what happened with Big Mom. I mean, after all, one of the giants saw her eating Mother Carmel and the children. But I don't think the giants know that Mother Carmel was actually a shady person. If anything, they really looked up to her because she saved some of the giants from the government a long time ago. However, CP0 does know how bad she is, and some of those agents might be her old orphans. So I wonder if Nami will at first appreciate Mother Carmel, but then later learn the truth somehow, and then almost feel bad for Big Mom. This could help Nami become motivated to start her own orphanage after the story, because obviously she would want to do things the right way. And I love that Oda's using one of the OG Straw Hats to kind of be the example of being a good mother, because moms don't get enough praise for anything that they do. And that goes double for moms in One Piece. About half of them we don't even know about, and almost all of them died while the child was still young. I mean, we're more than 1,100 chapters deep, and Luffy's mom is still a mystery, although I'm sure Oda has something special cooking up for that. But we just learned very recently in an SBS that Zoro's mom's name was Terra, and that she died from a disease a long time ago. Also, Usopp's mom tragically died of a disease when he was a kid, and since Yasop was MIA, that left Usopp as an orphan as well. Also, Porcus D. Rouge had the willpower to hold Ace for like two years before dying shortly afterward. And of course, Belmare died protecting Nami and Nojiko, obviously. Also, Sanji's mom died trying to give her kids a chance at being humans. And there's so many other examples outside of those. I mean, even poor old Dadan just had these three kids kind of thrown into her lap, but she took them in and raised them all the same. Even suffering when one of them died or celebrating when they get a new bounty poster. So at the end of the story, I think Oda will get to 
to use Nami as kind of the main motherly figure to pick up the pieces for the children that are left after the final war is over. Because it might be unfortunate to think about, but Nami will likely have her work cut out for her after it's all over. Oda may not kill off characters very often, but if there was ever a time to, it would definitely be the final saga. And it's not like there's a shortage of orphans as it is now anyway, so she could be in charge of a very important part of the post-world government era by making sure that every child has a home. This is part of why I suspect that if Nami did have her own House of Lambs, it would be on a sky island, because this would do a few things. I mean, first, it would simply tie perfectly to her weather-focused abilities, but second, it would provide great protection from anyone who wanted to attack them. It's a natural layer of security, almost. It's really hard to get to Sky Islands. And thirdly, this would make the island kind of mobile so that on one hand, kids could see different places around the world, but on the other hand, Nami could pick up children wherever they're at just by flying there. I mean, if your orphanage is over in Elbaf in the New World, but there's a group of kids in Paradise who need some help, it's not going to be that easy to help them. But it would be a lot easier if the orphanage just flew through the sky. So I think Nami will basically use everything she's learned from Weatheria and maybe even Zeus to have her own small sky island that she can move around as she demands. But the next straw hat that I want to cover is Brooke. Now this is my <laughs> personal favorite character in the entire story, and he pretty much has been since the day I found out that he was friends with Laboon. And we all know that those two will reunite eventually. So it would make sense that whatever Brooke does after the whole story's over, those two would be sticking together. So for this idea, I actually want to give a big shout out to Hidden Island, who mentioned this idea to me on stream before, and I just thought it was so good that there was no way I was going to go with something else. Because the gist for this idea is that Brooke would go on tour again as Soul King Brooke, except that every concert would just be inside of Laboon. Since Laboon has a literal island inside of him already, this would let them go on tour pretty much wherever they wanted. And they could even pick people up, load them inside, and dive down for a concert beneath the sea. We saw after Fishman Island that there were even other island whales who also recognized Brooke playing Bink Sake. So maybe these concerts will be loud enough that even the other whales and other fish in the sea, I guess, can hear the music too. Laboon and Brooke could start playing music for almost anyone anywhere in the world. And I just think this all would be really fitting because Laboon started enjoying music like day one with the Rumbar Pirates. That's a big reason why they ever got connected, and he's been waiting this whole time for their return. I mean, Brooke has the magic conch shell with the recording of Bink Sake specifically to play for Laboon. So having them continue to share that love for music together for the foreseeable future is just the perfect ending, I think. Also, I think it's safe to assume that Brooke will have his devil fruit awakened by the time we get to this point, because I mean, most of, if not all major characters with fruits should have their fruits awakened by the time the series is over, so maybe that can get involved with the concerts too. We know that paramecia fruits affect your surroundings when they awaken, so maybe he can almost turn the inside of Laboon to a very realistic, underworld-esque experience so that the concerts are kind of next level. I mean, one of the most famous pirate stories in the world is about ending up in Davy Jones' locker, which is at the bottom of the sea. And if they're loading people up inside of Laboon and going down to the deep depths of the sea, it would be really fitting for Brooke to add that underworld feel with his devil fruit. I mean, we know that music can affect your emotions and even your very soul, which is something Brooke did in Whole Cake Island against the Chess Keepers, so letting him kind of take that to the next level with his concerts that are inside of Laboon would just be a perfect ending. And sticking with that idea of touring around the world, the next straw hat I want to talk about is actually Sanji, because I think he will essentially finish what Zeph started. Of course, he will find the All Blue, which is both of their dreams, but then afterward, I think he will serve those fish from the All Blue in his own floating restaurant like the Baratier. And to do so, he'll probably do basically what the Sunny already does, which is have a big aquarium on board to hold those fish and keep them fresh. Sanji would just have to make a pit stop at the All Blue every once in a while to restock, which is maybe a perfect chance for him and Brooke to plan some kind of annual festival at the All Blue or something, where Sanji can serve the food and Brooke supplies the entertainment, which would be one hell of a color spread for Oda to draw. But the reason that this all makes a lot of sense to me isn't just that Sanji has the same dream as Zeph, or that they were both cooks, but that they were both stuck out at sea together starving. A floating restaurant would have come in real handy while those two were stranded. I mean, people die at sea all the time because they don't have any food. We kind of saw this early on in Baratier with Gein, who showed up hungry and Sanji fed him no problem. Feeding those who are hungry is one of the absolute biggest pillars of Sanji's character. So since Zeph made a floating restaurant after he retired, I think Sanji will do the same after accomplishing the dream that Zeph saved him for in the first place. 
And if he travels around the world, so many kids would get to hear of the All Blue and try the food from there who probably wouldn't have otherwise. So he might inadvertently inspire the next generation of cooks by doing what he already loves to do. And I think that will be a theme in a lot of what the Straw Hats are doing in the future, inspiring the next generation to be even better than them at whatever it is, even if they aren't trying to do that directly. And another example of that, I think, will ironically be Zoro. Because when I first started thinking about this video, I kind of marked Zoro down to maybe lead a dojo like his master Koshiro does, and maybe he could introduce three sword style as a more prominent sword technique or something. But then I realized Zoro doesn't really need to do that. We saw in a cover story that kids are already using three sword style back at his dojo because of him. If and when Zoro becomes the world's strongest swordsman, there will probably be even more young swords people who want to be just like him. I mean, Zoro even said as a child that he wanted to be so strong his name could be heard in heaven. So I'd assume that if he accomplishes that, kids around the world would also hear his name too. So when it came to what Zoro would do after the series, I had to kind of think more about this, because Zoro's main focus for the most part has been about getting stronger and protecting the crew. Once he reaches the pinnacle and becomes world's strongest swordsman, I don't think there's as clear of a landing spot for him as a lot of the other straw hats. So there's a couple ways that I kind of went about this. First is I considered that Rayleigh and Mihawk are probably both really good parallels for this situation. One is the retired right hand of the past Pirate King, and one is the current world's strongest swordsman. And both, at least for the most part, have lived pretty solitarily. Now, of course, Rayleigh seems to be shacking it up with Shacky sometimes, but he also gets caught as a slave on purpose because he's gambling too much, or sometimes he swims out to Amazon Lily and Ruskina and trains Luffy for a year and a half. So he's kind of doing his own thing out there. And then Mihawk was literally chilling in a castle in dark and dreary Muggy Kingdom all by himself until Perona showed up. So both of these guys are basically doing their own thing and kind of just enjoying their hobbies, I guess. And so I think that Zoro will end up being a mix of these two. For Rayleigh's side of things, Zoro will probably spend a lot of time doing his hobbies as well, which are mainly drinking and fishing, actually. But he also seemed to pick up gambling in Wano, so I can see him doing that just like Rayleigh does too. And maybe he'll stop and visit Hiori once in a while too, I don't know. But for Mihawk's side of things, this is where things get really interesting, because we don't really know a whole lot about Mihawk's ambitions outside of being a strong swordsman. I mean, we know that he was Marine Hunter at one point, but we really don't have a lot of context for the guy. But we do know that he very clearly has a vampire aesthetic, and his family name is one letter away from Dracula, and he also hangs out in a very dark, dreary, and evil looking place. And I think all of that parallels pretty nicely with Zoro, who just said that he wants to become the King of Hell. Now, vampires and demons or devils aren't exactly the same, of course, but we are in the same ballpark here. So while Zoro may spend some time doing the things he loves to do like Rayleigh has done, I also think that Zoro will tap into that demonic side a little bit as well, and literally become the King of Hell, just like he said after defeating King. Because remember, the Underworld is an actual place in One Piece, one that Brooke has visited before and returned from. And Zoro was visited by an actual Grim Reaper that we still don't know anything about, and the Reaper didn't even appear until literally right after Zoro said he was going to become the King of Hell. The dude must have not been very happy about Zoro trying to take his title. Or another fun theory about the Grim Reaper that's kind of similar is that the Grim Reaper was Pluton's Klebautermon, because Pluton is the god of the underworld and what's a king to a god. But either way, I just don't think it's a coincidence that right after Zoro said that line, we saw a freaking Grim Reaper. Nor do I think it's a coincidence that Zoro has the Asura ability, which is still unexplained to this very day, but in Hindu mythology, Asura are typically depicted as the evil demonic side who fight against the devas or the gods. I mean, the dude triples himself. There's no way that's not going to lead to something massive eventually. And there's always just kind of been something demonic about Zoro. I mean, think about how much pain he's able to handle as well. It's always been like death himself can't claim him. When Arlong held up Zoro and looked at his scars from Mihawk, he was shook. When Zoro took Luffy's pain bubble, Kuma thought he would die for sure. And then in Wano, we saw that the sword literally named after the King of Hell forced Zoro to consistently start using Conqueror's Hockey, or it would just kill him. But Zoro still met that challenge too. Oda has made the connections between Zoro and Hell very overt, and I think that's because Zoro will literally take the title of King of Hell at some point. And that's fitting because Brook and Zoro also share a lot of connections, like they were both kind of the right hands of their captains at one point, both of them are swordsmen, Zoro 
loves to drink and Brooke saying being sake, etc. So I can definitely see that connection kind of continuing and maybe eventually Brooke is just the key to Zoro getting to hell in the first place. Brooke might have to help him get there, maybe with awakening or something else altogether. I mean, we've seen recently with Saturn that he summoned his form with a pentagram circle, one that was very similar to the one in Brooke's time skip. So maybe Zoro will need to use Brooke to help him get down there and fight Saturn, or just some other Gorosei member altogether. I mean, Nustro's a swordsman, so he might make the most sense. But remember when Saturn said, I can't remember the last time I've been to the surface? Well, we saw that he was on the surface during God Valley, at least in his normal human form, so I'm thinking he's definitely talking about something else, and maybe he means that it's just the first time in a long time that he's been up from the underworld. I mean, maybe the Straw Hats will literally need someone to go and conquer hell, more or less, because of the fact that the government could be using it as a source of power, thus giving Zoro a very legitimate reason to go pursue that title of King of Hell. And I mean, typically, the Grim Reaper is kind of portrayed as someone who's sort of doing their job, which is primarily collecting souls to bring them down to the underworld. And I wonder if the King of Hell could do a similar thing in One Piece. Like, Zoro actually has to perform some kind of set of duties to hold on to that King of Hell title. And this is a really good parallel to Shiryu, actually, because he was a jailer in Impel Down, which is a massive allegory for Dante's Inferno in and of itself. And obviously, when the Straw Hats eventually fight the Blackbeard Pirates, Zoro will almost definitely be fighting Shiryu. So this connection could run kind of deep. Perhaps Zoro will surpass Shiryu in his own way and become a jailer of the literal hell by becoming king of hell. Zoro's future role might be keeping things in check down there, mainly so that demons like the Gorosei or Emu or whoever don't escape ever again. Remember, he did say that he wanted his name to be heard from heaven, and while we usually think of the underworld as the opposite thing, like the negative side to heaven, they may just be one and the same to some degree in One Piece, because when Brook died, we saw his soul return from the sky, but he still called it the underworld. So perhaps every soul just goes to the same place, which is the underworld, but the king of hell or whoever is the one that kind of decides what fate they have there, yet again being kind of a Dante's Inferno parallel. And this all also fits very well with Luffy being the sun god, because obviously, with Zoro being his first mate and usually having the second highest bounty, etc., they have an extremely close connection with one another. Even the fact that Zoro uses swords, which is Luffy's weakness, is a sign of this, and Zoro wants to be the best swordsman that there is. So for Luffy to become widely known and accepted as the sun god, and for Zoro to be widely known as accepted as king of hell would just be too perfect. But the next straw hat that I want to cover is Frankie. Now, Frankie's future is interesting because we kind of need to see where this connection to Vegapunk goes. It seems like currently Vegapunk is sort of the genius who's a little ahead of his time, because he or his satellites have mentioned how there aren't enough competent engineers, or how there's so many ideas but not enough time or resources. And I mean, right now, Vegapunk's pretty up there in age anyway, and he's being targeted by the government right now, so it seems like at some point, Frankie's gonna be left to kind of carry Vegapunk's torch and finish what he started. So what I kind of see Frankie doing in the future is just going around and kind of fixing or improving things around the world, whether that's changing weather on islands that need it like Karakuri, which Frankie visited in the time skip, or giving power to the world, which was Vegapunk's dream. Either way, Frankie's gonna carry that torch for him, because we know that the ancient kingdom was once highly advanced, similar to Egghead Island, so I think Frankie will sort of be the lead for making the One Piece world of the future more advanced as well. I mean, when Oda showed Frankie as his older self at ages 50 and 70, he even added a little caption about Frankie adding heating to this island, and then another caption about him fixing a kid's bike but adding a cannon. This kind of hints already that Oda plans for Frankie to eventually just improve people's technology wherever he goes and make the world better. And this fits in really well with Egghead because I think a big point of emphasis there has been that all these high-tech creations are great, but they also pose major risks. And that's basically what Frankie learned a long time ago with Tom. Frankie made all those battleships, mainly because he thought they were cool, but they were eventually used against him by bad people. Now the lesson there wasn't that you shouldn't make these new things at all, but more so that you can't turn your back on them when they fail you, because they're your creations. And Vegapunk is kind of having that same thing happen right now with his own creations, whether it's York or the Seraphim or the Mother Flame or whatever it is. And if the world of the future becomes more and more advanced, this same debate will probably keep happening with more and more new creations. And I just think that Frankie makes perfect sense to kind of lead that moral debate in the future about how to handle 
handle these different types of creations that they're making. And I think another really important moral debate that One Piece will have in the future will be about the Fishmen, which is why the next straw hat that I want to talk about is Jinbei. Because at first I thought to myself, oh yeah, Jinbei's gonna go back to Fishman Island and keep trying to ease tensions with humans or something like that. Except, thanks to Shiarly's prophecy, we know that Fishman Island won't exist in the future, at least not as we know it today. And the entire point of the Noah is to one day take all the Fishmen to the surface. So by the time we get to the end of the story, the Fishmen will all need places to stay, whether humanity is ready or not. And that's where Jinbei comes in, who will kind of be the perfect ambassador or liaison between the two sides. I mean, he's already an extremely respectful and honorable guy, and even though Luffy doesn't like being the hero, I'm sure the Straw Hats will be given some type of credit for saving the world at some point, thus making Jinbei, the Fishmen of that crew, easy for both humans and Fishmen to trust. And Shirahoshi could really help with that too, because she controls the Sea Kings. And being able to have the Sea Kings cooperate with pirates and maybe even marines from whatever new government the One Piece world ends up with would be hugely beneficial. This is probably what Poseidon's original purpose was, but thanks to the Void Century and Joy Boy's apology and everything, she and her people were stuck at the bottom of the sea until the new dawn. But now Poseidon can kind of order the Sea Kings to cooperate and, for example, not sink ships over in the Calm Belt anymore, which would be a big help to the world. Now I do think there's a chance that we get a new Fishman Island, because even if Fishmen start assimilating into the rest of the world, the bulk of them, as well as the royalty especially, will need kind of a main homeland to stay at. And I think the best place for this is right above where Fishman Island currently is. Because if the red line actually does get destroyed, then there should be some space on the sea level around there. I mean, maybe the rubble from the red line getting destroyed, which could end up being what destroys Fishman Island in the first place, on Honestly, could kind of act as a base for the new Fishman Island to be built on. And this would be really fitting because first off, they'd still get to act as the midway point for pirates going to the new world. But also, maybe new Fishman Island can be where the new reverie is held. It would be beneath where Marijua once was, which is a nice touch, but also it could be kind of an olive branch from whatever new government that exists after the dawn, because even if the government gets taken down, we have to remember that there's a lot of deep-rooted Fishmen racism around the One Piece world. And there's a lot of suffering that the Fishmen have faced, which they should rightfully be upset about. I mean, even Joy Boy left them a big apology on a Poneglyph. Everything isn't going to be fixed just because the Fishmen are allowed to live on the surface now, or even because they hold the reverie. There will still be tensions to ease out, and that's why Jinbei is going to have a very important role going forward. Kind of acting as someone that Fishmen and humans alike can admire, who is also following in both Fisher Tiger and Odohime's footsteps. But I do think that having the future reveries at New Fishman Island would be a good starting point for the Kings After the Dawn to show that they're serious about mending their relationship with the Fishmen. So speaking of that New World government that I keep mentioning, I want to spend some time talking about the future leaders of the world, like Vivi and Kobe especially. And what's exciting about most of these people is that they're kind of the next generation of political leadership in the One Piece world. We talk a lot about the next generation in terms of piracy, but Oda has also done a great job of creating a political equivalent to that, with Vivi especially, but even Carrot leading the Minx, Momo leading Wano, Rebecca and Riku leading Jess Rosa, and hell, even Iceberg over at Water 7 who's turning that island to a ship. All around the world, there are people who are friendly with the Straw Hats that are also in positions of power. We kind of saw this highlighted at the Reverie, where Vivi, Shirahoshi, and Rebecca met up and talked about Luffy, and also Sai and Leo who destroyed Charlos to save Shirahoshi as well, which is really cool when you consider the fact they actually saved Poseidon from being under control of the government. So a lot of these figures will obviously continue leading their respective islands, as well as shaping the political landscape in the post-world government world. And obviously many of them are friends with Luffy, but as we've seen from Luffy time and time again, I bet that he won't want the recognition of being a hero. Even though most political figures in the New Dawn will know Luffy was the one who saved them all, I bet they will all agree to attribute it to someone else else at Luffy's request, and I bet you that individual will be Joy Boy, or maybe Sun God Nika, and that will tell us in real time how the legend of Sun God Nika ever started. It was probably a very similar situation where someone who didn't like the limelight saved the world, but had everyone who was in power credit somebody else at their request. We already saw this happen in Wano, where the kids are already learning that Joy Boy saved them all. But in particular, I think that Vivi and Kobe will be especially important. So starting with with Vivi, I see her almost becoming like a much more benevolent
an emu in the future, and one that probably gets elected to that position. Because Vivi and the other kings around the world will probably just stay in their home islands after the new dawn, instead of living up in a castle up on the red line like the Celestial Dragons did before. I mean, remember, Lily had the option to stay up there and she didn't, so I think in the future, Vivi's gonna do the same thing. Plus, the red line might not even exist anyways, but regardless, whatever government exists in the future won't be at all like the last one. But there will be one, I think, because there needs to be that kind of infrastructure to help people around the world. It's not like the future will just immediately become a utopia. There will still be work to do, whether it's combating fishman racism, helping those suffering from natural disasters or diseases, or even those who get attacked by evil pirates. So I think there will be a central government of some kind, but the kings will just elect a top leader every so many years, and Vivi will be the first one. We saw something kind of like this at the Reverie, where they have a chairman role, which rotates every so often. Admittedly though, Vivi would probably be pretty busy leading both Alabasta and the new government in the future, and that's why her future husband is going to matter a lot, because he will be the king of Alabasta, technically. And I think that individual will definitely be Koza. I mean, he already may be her husband, because we know Shanks went to a random wedding in a desert a while back, which we still don't really know about. And she also told Cobra to go throw out all the letters from her suitors. So I think in the future, Koza can kind of focus on being king of Alabasta and leading that country, while Vivi can help shape the government, even if she still lives there. But on the flip side to all that, we have Kobe, who I think will eventually become the fleet admiral of the New Marines. This is something that I think is almost a lock. I mean, maybe Smoker will hold that position at first for a few years, because he's a bit older and Kobe's still kind of young. However, they want to work it out. But either way, Kobe is definitely going to lead the next generation of Marines. I mean, Garp has already said as much. I also wouldn't be surprised if he got a Devil Fruit at some point too, and probably a Logia, since, you know, most Admirals get one. And I bet the Marines will suffer some casualties during the final war, which might make some of these fruits available. And I think a Kainu's fruit is actually the perfect fit for Kobe, just because he has been kind of tied to him already. Now, obviously, Kobe had that moment where he yelled out in front of a Kainu in Marine Ford, which gave Shank some time to get there, but also, Hibari seems to have a thing for Kobe, and it seems like she might be a Kainu's daughter, or at least have some connection to him. And a Kainu's fruit is just so powerful that having it belong to someone like Kobe would help it do some actual good in the world, as opposed to whatever a Kainu has planned going forward. Or maybe another fun idea is that if Dragon truly does have the wind fruit, and he got it from the Marines way back when, well, if he were to die at any point in the future, then Kobe getting that one could be kind of cool too. Because then Luffy's brother's Logia and Luffy's dad's Logia would have gone to other people close to him, which really makes some thematic sense, I think. But I don't want to get too sidetracked in all the Devil Fruit talk, because the main thing here is just that Kobe will lead the new Marines in the future. And then lastly, I actually want to discuss Yamato, because obviously Momo will be in charge of leading Wano politically, and we all know that Yamato wants to be Odin and live just like him. That's kind of what Yamato's reasoning was for staying behind, although we pretty much know it's really because Momo still needs help protecting the island. But after the new dawn, Wano probably won't need that same level of protection. And so I think Yamato venturing out into the world like Odin did is pretty much a no-brainer. I do think Yamato will join the Straw Hats again eventually within the story, probably after Pluton gets released. But after the whole story's done, I think Yamato will actually just go out and adventure. Because even if Yamato joins the crew next chapter, there would be almost countless islands to visit around the world that the crew wouldn't have time to see. Odin wrote about his travels throughout his multi-year journey, and Yamato will probably do the same. The Ace novels are actually written this way too, from the perspective of Masked Deuce, who I actually think is the man marked by flames, by the way, and I'll link that video down below. But maybe Oda can even have fun with it and write a Yamato novel that takes place in a future world of One Piece, where Oda can either show us islands that never managed to make it into the canon story, or just use this novel as a way to show updates in the One Piece world that occurred after the dawn. So for just one random example, maybe in a theoretical Yamato novel, the journey takes us over to Raijin Island, an island with constant lightning strikes that we saw Yuruj visit early in the post time skip. But maybe Yamato pulls up and there aren't any lightning strikes. And then we see Frankie's there talking to some townspeople about a machine he built that fixed the weather. So then Yamato and Frankie could maybe have a cool random meetup that mixes their future roles in the world. And it shows us how the One Piece world has progressed at the very same time. There are probably hundreds of examples like this that I could go over, which is why I think this really makes for a fun and interesting way to make Yamato's future really matter. 
But the next straw hat that I want to cover is Robin, and she's a really interesting one because a lot of her focus in the story has revolved around her ability to read the Poneglyphs. I mean, her dream is to uncover the Void history. But pretty obviously, once the final war happens and the dawn comes, she will have discovered that history, and a lot of the world will probably become familiar with it too. So it's hard to say what her role would necessarily be going forward. I mean, sure, she might want to teach that history so it doesn't get repeated, but she's an archaeologist as opposed to a teacher. What she wants to do is keep finding out new information. And I mean, as long as the new history books are printed with the void history told, then she wouldn't really need to worry about that information being shared and protected anyway. I actually think Morgans will print or even broadcast a lot of the void history to the world at some point as well. So the point here is mainly that Robin's going to need something else to do. And really, all I can think about is that she's just going to continue uncovering more history. Because even if she accomplishes her main goal of figuring out the void century, we know there's thousands of years of history before that. And it also seems likely that a lot of the recorded history from that time period was destroyed, or maybe submerged by the ocean. Or maybe some of it is even recorded on different planets, since, you know, Enel did find ruins on the moon that talked about the past too. So who knows where Robin could end up while she's looking for more history to find. I mean, for example, we know there was a long war between the Long Arm and Long Leg tribes even before the Void Century. And maybe Robin can kind of find more information on that. Or maybe she can find information on what was going on 4,000 years ago, which is when Alabarna was built in Alabasta. Or 5,000 years ago, which is when the Tree of Knowledge was first planted in Ohara. Even if some of this stuff isn't quite as exciting as the literal Void history, Robin's main hobby is being an archaeologist. She finds this stuff interesting. And as long as there is history to figure out, then I think she's going to try discovering it and saving it. I mean, if you go back to her fight in Skypea, she was especially angry with the destruction of the ruins, because it's hard to recapture the history that those ruins might be telling. Once they're destroyed, it could be gone forever. So maybe what she does is she even builds her own archaeology team, just like Clover and her mom kind of did. Not to uncover the void history this time, though, but to uncover all the history of the world. I could even see her planting her own tree of knowledge eventually, which would be a beautiful way to kind of bookend her life story by having the first tree of knowledge fall the day that Ohara got attacked, but have a new one planted after her dream's been accomplished and the next version of Ohara is created. And similarly, I think Chopper could do something just like that, but with all the diseases of the world. Because we know that his dream is to create the panacea, the cure all for any disease. And I did a video a few months back about why this panacea is probably just going to end up being his devil fruit, or technically himself also. But I think the more realistic way for other people to start curing more things around the world would just be to start teaching people how to do so. For a lot of the crew members up until this point, I kind of shied away from the idea of, oh, they're just going to lead the next generation of people doing the same thing that they do, because that's kind of too easy. But for Chopper, and to a lesser extent Robin, they might be the two who actually need to do that since their expertises are so knowledge-based. I mean, if you go back to when Lal was studying to be a doctor as a kid, he was studying so much that he was actually going to skip out on the festival in town. And Chopper's mentor in Here You Look showed us what can happen when you try to be a doctor with the right intentions, but not the right knowledge. I mean, anyone who knows a thing or two about medical school knows how much studying there is. And that's why I think Oda did Chopper's backstory the way he did. Here You Look told us that Chopper had the most important thing to be a good doctor, which was a good heart, but Kureha then told us that a good heart wasn't enough on its own. But you also need expertise. And that's why Chopper learned from her and became the doctor that he is today. It took some good old-fashioned studying and experience to get there. So I think Chopper almost has to continue that through line and teach the next generation of doctors because he's going to inherently know more and be better at it than most other people. We kind of already saw this with Miyagi and Tristan during the Wano arc when they helped Chopper make the cure for the Ice Oni virus. I mean, if you go back to Drum Kingdom, they even had something called the 20 MDs, who were basically all the doctors within the country. And I can kind of see Chopper having his own group like that, but ones that are under his tutelage. And I think that Chopper's teachings could kind of even help improve the shoddy doctrine that we've seen throughout the One Piece world over and over. Now, I'm not saying it's all of their faults because, you know, some of these diseases are just hard to cure, but in both Law's flashback as well as Bonnie's, we see how most doctors are not equipped to handle unique diseases like white lead or sapphire scale. And even Chopper failed to cure the smile situation in Wano, which was unfortunately only mentioned in an SBS. They also needed Vegapunk to treat the gigantification in the Punk Hazard Kids, so even as it stands now, Chopper doesn't have the answer to everything. But medicine is one of those fields of study that compounds on itself, and each discovery might help with the next one and so forth. So Chopper being at the forefront of this and probably ending up heralded as one of the
the best doctors ever is basically what I see happening. I mean, in Thriller Bark, Chopper was real excited to meet Dr. Hogback because of all the great things that he's heard about him. But then Chopper learned pretty quickly that Hogback wasn't as great as he thought. So I think that in the future, Chopper will eventually have people viewing him like he viewed Hogback. Except, obviously, Chopper will be the real deal. And, of course, Chopper will still never learn how to handle those compliments either. And now we're on to our final two crew members, so let's start with Usopp. God Usopp, that is. The future Sniper King. Not the current one, though, because Soge King is someone else. And despite Usopp's heroics and his tall tales that are slowly becoming legitimate tales, I think the natural place for him to end up is back in Syrup Village with Kaya. I know it seems kind of basic on the surface, but I think it's almost a perfect match to have someone with such fame and bravado like Usopp go back to his small little island town and go back to the girl he's been into since day one. You'd imagine that someone with the name God Usopp would have a royal palace or something like that, but having him just go back to his small little village that he was from originally is just perfect. And the reason I really like this, actually, is because of Yasop. Yasop didn't go out to sea until after he had a kid. He abandoned Usopp because the pirate flag was calling. And sure, Usopp kinda abandoned Kaya like a day after her evil butler almost killed her and took her fortune, but whenever he's done, they'll probably just do the more reasonable thing and have kids after he returns. So that way, Usopp doesn't have to be a deadbeat dad like his dad was. It would just be so perfect for Usopp, who has such fame and notoriety now, to almost have the most simple life of all the Straw Hats. I mean, after he becomes a brave warrior of the sea in Elbaf, who knows how famous he could be. I can totally see him in a future Syrup Village just telling stories all day about his adventures, which most people probably think are just lies, but we know actually happened. Because Usopp's adventures have been so crazy that most people probably just wouldn't believe him at this point, even if they're true. And that's a great parallel to Nolan the Liar, I think. Someone who we all already know has tons of connections to Usopp. And Noland was also, for the most part, a normal family man. Yes, he went on crazy expeditions and was very powerful in his own right, but he had a family back in Love Neil and spent a lot of time with them. Even in Skypea, he refused to marry Calgara's daughter because of his family back home. He's a good man through and through, and Usopp will embody that as well. We even saw Nolan telling tales to children back in Love Neil, including the story about the dwarves. And I can totally see Usopp sitting in Syrup Village also talking about the dwarves in a very similar way. But one other fun layer to this is that I think he might rename Syrup Village to Sniper Island. Or rather, people will come to call Syrup Village Sniper Island just because the Sniper King lives there. I talked about this a little bit towards the end of my Usopp vs. Augur video, so if you want more context, definitely go check that out. But the main thing is that Soge King told us that Sniper Island exists in our hearts. So I think that's a sign that Sniper Island doesn't exist right now. Perhaps it existed in the past but got destroyed, but the idea that I like even more is that it'll be somewhere that exists in the future. And since Usopp's a character that's almost entirely focused on building up these larger-than-life stories, I think it would be really fitting for Quiet Old Syrup Village to become known as this great Sniper Island, kind of mirroring the idea that Usopp could be the Sniper King one day when he's really just a normal person from this quiet little town. But now it's time to wrap this up with our story's protagonist, Luffy. This entire journey that we've been on has been because of him. And while each crew member has their own dreams and ambitions, they've all made it very clear how much they too want him to accomplish his goal of finding the One Piece. So once that's all over and Luffy even accomplishes his secret second dream that we still don't know about, what could possibly be left for him? Well, this is interesting because if we parallel it to the last Pirate King, being Roger, he died soon afterward. He was gonna die soon to his disease anyway, so he just turned himself in and was executed. But Luffy will bring the new dawn, and if Kobe or Vivi are making decisions, he would never get executed anyway. Plus, it's hard to believe that Oda would kill off his main character even in a theoretical future universe separate from the main story. I mean, if for nothing else, it's just for marketing purposes. So this answer here is kind of a two-parter, because there is one part about Roger that I think Luffy will absolutely mimic, and that's inspiring the next generation. And in fact, we've already seen him doing this because of Makano's child reacting to Luffy's bounty poster. We also saw in Elbath that there was a giant child trying to join Shanks just like Luffy did. Even if Luffy brings a new dawn, Oda has already shown us that there will be a next generation, and that some of these kids will be inspired by Luffy. I mean, I mentioned earlier how kids at Zoro's Dojo are using Three Sword Style as well now, and I think a very similar thing will happen with other kids around the world because of Luffy, even if he avoids getting the credit because he doesn't like being a hero. Kids will just look up 
up to whatever version of him they're told about, whether that's Joy Boy or Nika or whatever. They'll probably all say they want their punches to be like pistols, even if they don't know who actually started that. But to be clear, despite what is even shown on the thumbnail, I don't think this is a situation where Luffy, like, actually gives the hat to one specific kid. Instead, I think he will just inspire tons of different kids sort of by osmosis, just by being who he is and accomplishing his dreams. The tall tales that are told about Luffy will be the inspiration for these children. And another reason for this is just simply, I think Luffy's always going to keep the straw hat. Even if he gets another cool pirate hat later as Pirate King, he's still going to have the straw hat with him. I mean, he's straw hat Luffy. I get that passing the straw hat to each generation has kind of been a symbolic thing throughout the story from Roger to Shanks to Luffy, but the prior two didn't go by straw hat Roger or straw hat Shanks. The straw hat is so deeply tied to Luffy's identity that I think he's just going to keep it. And again, it's kind of also just the marketing of it all. But when it comes to inspiring that next generation, I think it will just happen organically. I guess Luffy can kind of spiritually give the straw hat to kids throughout the world just because of his actions and heroics. Now, like I said, a lot of the world would probably come to believe someone else saved them, like Joy Boy or Sun God Nika, but I'm sure there will still be a large chunk of people who know the actual truth as well. I could even see a thing where most of the living people in the world today know that it was actually Luffy, but they all say and act like it was Nika or Joy Boy or whatever just out of respect for him, so that future generations and even, you know, young kids today will actually think it's Joy Boy or Nika or whoever, but the people of this time period will know that it was Luffy all along. And that would be really fitting because, I mean, on most islands that they visited, Luffy made it very clear who he was before he ever started wreaking havoc. I mean, he loves to tell people he's Monkey D. Luffy who will be King of the Pirates. And even in Dressrosa, we saw an example of this all where they built a statue to Luffy instead of Luffy, even though they were all told by Gyatz who he really was. They knew it was Luffy, but still did a Luffy statue. So I think in the future, they'll know it's Luffy, but out of respect for Luffy, just say it was someone else. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Whether kids are looking up to Joy Boy, Nika, or Luffy, it all ends up working the same because they're all the same good role model. They're all the same person at the end of the day who are worthy basing your actions off of. I mean, this is part of why the government has tried taking out everyone who talks about Nika in the first place. If that legend is told, then that will is shared and can be inherited. And surely once the world is saved, the word of their savior will be spread far and wide, regardless of what they call him. But this still leaves the question of what does Luffy himself do after this is all said and done? Where does he eventually spend the rest of his life? Well, I think the easy answer here is that he just marries Boa and has a family. I mean, Roger pretty much right after becoming Pirate King said that his son would be the one to find the One Piece, despite not even having a child yet. So he went and had one with Porcus D. Rouge. So maybe even in the post-dawn One Piece world, there will still be a One Piece or some kind of treasure for people to pursue, and Luffy will also want to have a kid so that they can chase after it themselves. Now the issue with this is that it could be a pretty clean setup for a two-piece story, but I still don't think that would ever happen. But I do think that Oda could set it up this way just to illustrate what Dragon told us in chapter 100, that there are three things that cannot be stopped, an inherited strength of will, one's dreams, and the ebb and flow of the ages. I think that this will hold true even into the far distant One Piece future. So that will to adventure, the dreams that take people out to the sea, and the passage of time that brings these new generations to power will continue forever and ever. And Oda's an author who loves to show more than tell. So I think at the very end of the story, after the world has kind of been changed for the better, we'll get to clearly see that there's still a next generation ready to go and make the world even better than how Luffy and the crew left it. And so that's it for this video, guys. If you enjoyed this kind of thought experiment video, then please let me know with a big like and subscribe down below. Maybe even a comment if you feel like it, because those are really the best ways to support the channel right now. And if you haven't had enough yet, then maybe try out this video that YouTube told me you'd probably most like to watch after this. But until next time, later.